Hare Krishna, welcome everyone, welcome Maharaj. Uh, it is our utmost fortune to have you and all the devotees in our house today. I'll uh, do a brief introduction of Maharaj. Many of you know him already, but, but for my own purification, uh, please bear with me. Bhakti Vigna Vinash Narasimha Maharaj uh, received initiation from Srila Prabhupada in 1971. And a year later, he also received second initiation. He has been preaching for the last 20 years very famously in Asian countries such as India, Philippines, China and Thailand. Through his years of preaching, he has given, we all know this, many of us know this, has given countless souls uh, practical guidance and deep inspiration. Maharaj took sannyas in Mayapur from Tamal Krishna Goswami Maharaj in 1994, which did not mean any change in lifestyle for him. Maharaj was already always so strict in his sadhana. Whoever gets to know Maharaj, and we have had the fortune of sitting in classes by Maharaj in Singapore a few times, and this is so true, uh, admires and respects his sincere and faithful practice of chanting the holy names of the Lord and his mastery over the scriptures. So with whatever gratitude uh, my heart can ask Master Maharaj, uh, we welcome you and thank you for being here. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Om Namo Bhagavate So we are in the auspicious month of many festivals and just now we are We've been having celebration of Julan Yatra, <coughs> customary to celebrate the Julan Yatra, placing the divine couple on the swing, and the devotees also come and take turns to pull the swing and give pleasure to their Lordship Sri Sri Radha and Krishna. <laughs> Jill and Yatra, it's, it's a festival for all the devotees to take part in, for the pleasure of Radha and Krishna. Radha and Krishna are our worshipful lords and we are their servants. And we like to put, we like to make arrangements for their pleasure. So Dulan Yatra is what's going on at present moment, and it goes on up until Balaram Purnima. That will be the first of our festivals, the major festivals, which will take place in the coming weeks. Lord Balaram's appearance day on the full moon. Lord Balaram, of course, is the older brother of Lord Krishna and he had appeared first of all in the womb of Devaki and then by the power of Yoga Maya he was transferred to the womb of Rohini. So his birth 
was in Goku because his birth was from not from Devaki's womb but from the womb of Rohini. Lord Balaram comes in the mood of a servant of Lord Krishna. Although he's the older brother, he comes in the mood of servant. It is said that previously, in the previous incarnation, the Lord has come as Lord Ramachandra. And at that time, Lord Balaram came as the younger brother, as Lakshman. But as Lakshman, he had a very difficult time trying to make arrangements for the pleasure of his older brother. Lord Rama would not allow him to make nice arrangements for his comfort. The, the three, Mother Sita along with her husband Lord Ramachandra and their bro brother Lakshman had all gone into the forest to spend uh, 14 years in the forest to accept that vow which was uh, requested by Kaike through her husband, Maharaj Dasara, the father of Ram and Lakshman and Bharat and Shatrutna. So during their exile in the forest, Lakshman would regularly try to make arrangements. He wanted to give comfort. He did not like to see his brother having to undergo so many austerities and difficulties in the forest. But Lord Ramachandra would not allow. He said, no, we have come to the forest. We should live like forest dwellers. I am not here to live comfortably. And it became very difficult for Lakshman. It was so difficult for him to do service for his brother that he vowed that in the future incarnation, I will not come as a younger brother. I will come as an older brother. And then I'm, when I'm the older brother, he cannot chastise me. He cannot just get me, make me do everything he wants. And so it happened that Lord Balaram came as the older brother of Lord Krishna. And as part of his service to Lord Krishna, he took birth first in the womb of Devaki and he made arrangements for the appearance of Lord Krishna. It's the duty of all the devotees to make nice arrangements for the pleasure of Radha and Krishna. So Lord Balarama appears in the womb of Devaki and he makes sure everything is perfect, perfectly arranged for the appearance of his younger brother, Lord Krishna. Earlier, Devaki had already given birth to six sons, and one by one they had all been killed by Lord Kamsa. By Kamsa, cruel King, King Kamsa had killed them all, one after another. So, it, we should understand these six sons, by Kamsa killing them, he was removing different inauspicious effects and it was making arrangement for the appearance of Lord Krishna. The six sons represent the six evil influences, Kam, Krod, Lob, Moha, Madha, Matsarya. And when Kamsa killed these six sons, it removed that influence from the world. And it made it possible for Lord Balaram to then come into the womb of Devaki make arrangements, make sure everything is perfect for Lord Krishna to come. Just like before the king comes, the minister will first of all come and make sure everything is ready for the appearance of the, the king. So in the same way Lord Balaram came in that mood as the older brother coming to do personal service for his brother, Lord Krishna. But actually, Lord Balarama is also the personality of Godhead. There is no difference between Lord Krishna and Lord Balarama, except for color, of course. Lord Krishna is a bluish color, and Lord Balaram is a white color. But as far as the opulences go, they're equal. 
Lord Balarama is also the personality of Godhead. He's endowed with all opulences. But he comes in the mood of a servant. His purpose is to give pleasure, to give service to Lord Krishna. It is sometimes said, Lord Balaram is the original spiritual master. He is the Adi Guru. Just as the purpose of the spiritual teacher is to show us how to serve Lord Krishna, Lord Balaram also comes to show us how to serve Lord Krishna. So he appeared in the womb of Devaki, made sure all arrangements were perfect for Lord Krishna to then enter into the womb. He was in the womb of Devaki for a period of seven months and then Yogamaya, under the arrangement of Yogamaya, he was transferred to the womb of Rohini, who was also a wife of Vasudev, but she was staying over in Goku at the home of Nanda Maharaj. And there she gave birth to Lord Balaram. So one of the names of Lord Balaram is Rohini Nanda, one who gives pleasure to Rohini. He's the son of Rohini. But he appeared, first of all, in the womb of Devaki. So Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram are brothers. And they're eternally brothers. And when Lord Krishna came into this world, Lord Balaram is also his brother. So we want to understand that mood of Lord Balaram as a servant. The, 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 the mood of being the servant, although he is the Supreme Lord, he takes the position of a servant. It's very important for us also to develop that mood to be the servant, to want to give service to Lord Krishna. This time of the year, at this particular time, and just a week ago, we began the period of Chaturmashya. The same, the same time, at the same time, the Buddhist monks also began their four months of austerity. And so it's a period of Chaturmashya, Chaturmashya, four months during which time traditionally in the, in the, it was the rainy season for four months would be a period of rain and people would not want to travel at that particular time. Particularly the sannyasis who were traveling they would like to just stay in one place. You can read in the Chaitanya Charitamrita how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, was traveling in South India and he had come to Trichy. He had come to the biggest Vaishnava temple, the temple of Lord Ranganā at Sri Ranga. And it, it was just beginning, four months of Chaturmasya were just beginning when he had, he had arrived there at Sri Ranga. So he went for darshan at the temple and when he was there, he met with one of the priests, Balabhavata, who was one of the priests engaged in the service of Lord Rangana. So at that time, Balabhavata invited Lord Chaitanya to take his meal at his home. Not only did he invite him to take his meal, but he requested Lord Chaitanya. He said, now is the beginning of Chaturmasya. It's the beginning of the four months of austerity. Please stay with us for the period of Chaturmasya and you can enlighten us on the glories of Lord Krishna. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu agreed. He accepted the request because it's customary. During the Chaturmasya, the sannyasis who are usually moving from one place to another, they will just stay in one place and they will do some austerities. 
Many of you must have seen the photographs of Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati during the period of Chaturmasya. He'd grown a big beard. He's got his beard, you know. So that that was ta that photograph was taken during the time of him observing the Chaturmasya, because often people during the period of Chaturmasya they will not shave the face, and uh, that is a, an austerity for some people. <laughs> you see, to shave the to shave. To not shave the face is an austerity. And not only will they not shave the face, they will not shave the head also. And they will not cut the nails, fingernails or toenails. They will not cut them during the Chaturmasya. And also, of course, there are different methods, different levels of practicing the Chaturmasya. I'm telling you what was the tradition in the past, and particularly Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that he was following this Chaturmasya, because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had accepted the sannyas order of life in the line of Shankaracharya. He had taken sannyas from Keshava Bharati Maharaj who was coming in the line of Shankaracharya. And the followers of Shankaracharya, the sannyasis, were known to be very strict in their vows. First of all, before they can be initiated as a sannyasi in that line, they must be from a Brahmana family. Of course, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was. He was the son of Jagannath Mishra. So Mishra is Brahman caste. So for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to be initiated into the sannyas order was not difficult. He was coming from the Brahmana family and Keshava Bharati initiated him. That was performed at the place Katwa. Katwa is north of Mayapur. If you ever get the opportunity to go to Maya, how many of you have been to Mayapur? Oh, most nearly everyone, right? <laughs> Good. So, when you go to Mayapur, I hope sometimes you will go and visit Katwa. Any of you visit Katwa? Yes, some people, a few people, yes. So Katwa is the place, uh, it's only uh, maybe a, an hour and a half from Mayapur. You have to leave early in the morning if you're going to go because it's a small town and they have restrictions on the traffic there during the daytime. They will not allow cars on the road there to after 8 o'clock in the morning. So you have to get there a little early in the morning. Otherwise, they won't let your car in. And if you go with a group of people, then <laughs> if it's a bus, you have to park a, a little further away. But you can also go by train. You can also get a train there, which is quite convenient. So going to Katwa is a place of Lord, Krish, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur writes in one of his songs about practicing devotional service. He said, may I always visit all the holy places associated with the pastime of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Lord Chaitanya had gone to Katwa. He swam across the Ganga early in the morning and then walked to Katwa to the ashram of Keshava Bharati. And there Keshava Bharati was requested to initiate him into the renounced order of life. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had already informed some of his very intimate associates that he was going to do this. So some of them had come there to witness the ceremony and to assist in the ceremony. Although, although they did not like it, but they could not persuade him not to do this. So anyway, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu accepted that initiation and 
being initiated in that line of Shankaracharya, he was naturally obliged to follow all the principles of renunciation for that line. Principles like bathing three times a day. And Mahaprabhu followed this strictly. When he was in Jagannath Puri, three times a day, he would go to the sea and take his bath at, in the sea at Jagannath Puri. He would have darshan, Lord Jagannath, and then it would come time to say, ah, now I have to go for my bath. And every day he would bathe three times a day. So that was part of his duty. It said, it said uh, brahmacharis, they would bathe once a day. Grihastas, they should bathe twice a day. And the sannyasi, he should bathe three times a day. And Mahaprabhu was doing like this strictly. I saw also uh, Srila Tamal Krishna Goswami, he was also doing like this sometimes when he was traveling around. I remember particularly one time he had come to China. I was staying in China and he had come there to visit us and he was taking bath three times a day. Even though there was no hot water and it was very cold, but he insisted that he had to follow this vow. And so it, it's that's a question. Anyway, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had taken sannyas, he'd gone to Jagannath Puri, and then he wanted to go into South India. And he came down into South India, he came to Sri Ranga, which is the biggest of the Vaishnava temples. It's a very famous temple. And it's surrounded by seven walls because so many different occasions the temple was attacked. And each time the, the Vaishnavas would build a wall around the temple to keep the intruders out. So it's a very magnificent temple and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very happy to be there. And when Balabhabhata invited him to come and stay there and observe Chaturmashya, he agreed. He thought, yes, I should do it. I should stay. I will stay here with you. And he stayed there in, in Sri Ranga at the home of Balabhabhata. And every day he would go to see Lord Rangana in the temple. And he observed his vow of Chaturmashya. There are different levels of practicing Chaturmashya. We should understand, first of all, that Chaturmashya is not just for sannyasis. It's for everyone. That, and Srila Prabhupada certainly expected everyone to And Srila Prabhupada has given us a minimum standard of renunciation. Just like when it came to chanting the holy name, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada had requested everyone to chant one lakh names every day. Now one lakh names means 64 rounds. But the devotees said to Prabhupada, we cannot do it. We're not able to chant so many rounds. So then Srila Prabhupada suggested 32 rounds, meaning half a lakh, and he said, oh, no, it's still too much, we cannot do it. So finally Srila Prabhupada said then, all right, 16 rounds, but you must chant 16 rounds. And this was like a concession from Srila Prabhupada. But he said, if you can chant more, it will be good for you. But you must chant at least 16 rounds every day. And then for Chaturmashya, Srila Prabhupada has written in the Chaitanya Charitamrita that during the first month we should not take sak, which means spinach or green leafy vegetables. During the second month we should not take yogurt. During the third month we should not drink milk. And during the fourth month no, uh, no, right. 
the fourth month is maybe the greatest challenge for the devotees, right? <laughs> Means no dosa, no, no idli, no urdha. Mm. Actually, Srila Prabhupada also said, the fourth month we should not take any high protein foods, especially things like meat. We should encourage meat eaters that during the month of Chaturmasya, it will be very good for them to be strict vegetarian. Although people may be regularly meat eaters, we should encourage them to try to follow this vow during the month of the fourth month. The fourth month meaning the month of Kartik, right? The month of yeah, when we have the Dhammadar Puja during that time, the month of Karti, so that during that time we encourage people to be a strict vegetarian and don't take high protein foods, meaning or dal, masur dal, chana, these things which are very high in protein. It, it's a, an austerity, tapasya. Tapasya is recommended. It's one of the pillars of religion. The personification of religious principles comes in the form of the bull. And bull stands on four legs, the four pillars of dharma. Satyam, Sojam, Daya, and Tapa. So Tapa, austerity. It sounds frightening to some people, but actually Tapa simply means that we should give up pride. We should give up pride. We should become humble souls. That is an austerity in the Kali Yuga. We are very foolishly proud. Although we have nothing to be proud of, but somehow due to our covering by the material energy, we identify with the material body and we think of ourselves as being something worthy of praise. But actually we're very low and we're insignificant. So tapasya, that is a tapasya, to give up pride. Sometimes Srila Prabhupada would also describe that pride is destroyed by intoxication. Pride is a type of intoxication. We become, we're proud. It, it's it's an, an illusion. Just like when people are intoxicated, they're in illusion. You know, people may drink alcohol or they may take drugs. They become intoxicated and they do stupid things. So we have to be careful to give up intoxication. Things like drugs and alcohol are certainly intoxication. But the most difficult thing is to give up pride because it is pride which is covering our pure spiritual nature. How to overcome pride? One way in which can help us to overcome pride is by surrendering to the lotus feet of a spiritual master. That takes humility. It requires us to sacrifice our false ego, to come before a, a person and request him to be our spiritual teacher. Just like in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna did, describes that the sacrifice of knowledge is to accept the shelter of a spiritual teacher. In the Bhagavad Gita, in the fourth chapter, verse 34, Lord Krishna describes Right. Lord Krishna has described the qualification of a person desiring to advance in knowledge. 
Prani Patena. First of all, he has to submit. He has to fall down. Prani Patena. To fall down without reservation. To fall down, to submit ourselves to someone. And then Prani Patena. Pari Prashnena. Pari Prashnena. Pariprashnena means to ask questions, to put questions before the spiritual teacher. And these questions should be of a spiritual nature, where we desire to improve and understand more the teachings of Lord Krishna. So, Pranipatena Pariprashnena Sevaya, and then giving service. That is a qualification for the disciple. And just as there's qualification for the disciple, there is also qualification for the teacher, which is described. Pariprashna Upadeshantite Gyaninas Tattvadarshina. He's a Tattvadarshi. He has seen the truth. Not only has he seen the truth, but it can reveal the truth to others. You get some people, they, if they will say, I know the truth. If you ask them, okay, tell me, please, what is it? Oh, I, I can't put it into words. I can't, I can't tell you. I can't explain it. And so it means their realization is not complete. That they, if they say they know the truth, they've seen the truth, but they're not able to explain it. They're not able to put it into words. You cannot tell others about it then they haven't got the full understanding of the truth. But the actual qualification of the bona fide spiritual teacher is not only that they have seen the truth, but they can present it to others also. And so, like this, when we come and submit ourselves before the spiritual teacher, it's a very humbling process. And that Developing humility is very good for us to take away false pride. We want to give up that pride which is covering our true ego. True ego is to understand I am the servant of Lord Krishna. Krishna is the master and I am his servant. The false ego is to think I am the doer. Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes, Prakriti, Right, the foolish person thinks himself to be the doer of activities which are actually carried out by the modes of nature. So, the, the false ego, under the influence of false ego, we're thinking, I am the doer, I did this, look at me. We're thinking, this is mine. But the true ego is to understand, I am simply a tiny servant of the Supreme Lord Krishna. We want to de develop that pure ego. Therefore, in order to come to that purity, we have to accept some austerity. And one of Srila Prabhupada's favorite verses in the Srimad Bhagavatam was a verse spoken by Lord Rishabdev to his 100 sons. Lord Rishabdev was an incarnation of the Lord. Of course, he's very much respected by the Jain people. The Jain people consider Rishabdev, one of the Tirthakars, one of the great uh, uh, teachers in their line of Jainism. We consider Rishabdev not just to be a teacher, but to be an incarnation of God. And in Srimad Bhagavatam, it's described how he was preparing to retire and to enter into Vanaprastha life. And he was going to go into the forest to do some austerities. But before he retired, which is something we should all want to do, you know, and, it is, and retiring is not just giving up your work. The re retiring is taking up spiritual work. 
giving up the material duties to take up fully the responsibility of spiritual duties. And the Vedas prescribe we should do this. Uh, the Vedas say, Pancha Sodvam Vanam Prajit. From the age of 50, we should begin to consider, we should think very seriously about retiring from the material world and committing ourselves more fully to the activities of devotional service. So Rishav Dev, oh, oh by the way, that, that kind of retirement, it can be done, it, you can do it at your home, you don't have to leave home, you don't have to leave your family, but you do have to stop worrying about your eco economic situation. You have to put aside material desires and just focus on spiritual life. The real business of those who are in the Vanaprastha order is to worship the Lord and to read the scriptures and to chant the holy name. And Srila Prabhupada recommends that people should go to the holy dham, like Mayapur and Vrindavan. And there you can practice Vanaprastha life. A very appropriate place. And of course today we have many devotees who have moved there to Mayapur from places like the Middle East. They've gone to live in Mayapur to do service there. Some are in Vrindavan, some are in other places like Chennai and Trivandrum, different places where we have temples. And there they take up service because we do need people to serve in our temples. And there's a need to do deity worship and to, to give lectures and distribute knowledge and to do, make the offerings for the deities. So many things to be done in the different centers. So this is something which you all have to plan that at some point you have to detach yourself from the business here, from the activities here, and you have to go back, go, go back to the roots, right? Go back to the roots. Where are your roots? Your roots are in the Holy Dham with the Lord and engaging in His service there. So we encourage you to think like that. Rishabh Dev, Lord Rishabh Dev, he was a king of the world and he was retiring. He, was, he had a big job. He was making much more money than any of you ever made. He was the ruler of the world. He was so wealthy. So he gave it all up to go and live in the world. And before he retired, he instructed his 100 sons. He gave them very important instruction because he wants them to, to please, to, to, to carry out their life in a proper manner, which is according to his, his own desire. So, Lord Rishabdev told his sons, Nayam de ho de haba jamna raloke, kushtam kamarna hate vid pujamne. Lord Rishabde is telling his sons that there's no need to worry about sense gratification. He said, even the hawks which eat stool, they are getting sense gratification. They fill their belly, they satisfy their genital and different things like this. This, that pleasure is there even for the animals like the dogs and the hogs. So he told his son, don't do like that. Don't just be like an animal, but control your mind and senses and do some tapasya, do some austerities. And by doing some austerity, you can purify yourself. And as you become purified, 
you will experience real pleasure. Real pleasure will be awakened once we have purified our mind and senses. So in this Kali Yuga, you see, it's made very easy for us to purify ourselves. That we just simply have to chant the holy name. Everything comes from the chanting of the holy name. We don't have to do great austerities like Lord Rishabh Dev did or like other people did in the previous yuga. In the Kali Yuga, we just simply have to take shelter of the holy name. And by chanting the holy name, then we clean the heart. Cheto Dhatana Marcharam Bhavana Bhavanimya Yes, we say Param Vijayate Shri Krishna Sanki. All glories to the Sri Krishna Sankirtan, which cleanses the heart of all the dust accumulated for years together. And certainly there's a lot of dust accumulating around here in this part of the world, right? It's a desert area, <laughs> dust everywhere. <laughs> so we can, but we can cleanse that dust by the chanting of the holy names, by Sankirtan Yagya. And this is how we can actually experience real pleasure gives us a taste of the full nectar for which we are always anxious. We're very anxious, we're eager to get pleasure, spiritual pleasure, and it can be had very easily, simply by the chanting of the holy name. And that's something everyone can take part in. All the young children also will take part in the kirtan, right? As soon as we begin to give classes, then the children disturb. <laughs> but when there's kirtan, children are happy. They join in the kirtan. They also chant and dance. So this is, this is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy, that he is given a process which is simply joyful. Lord Krishna asked everyone to surrender, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Mahabhadanaya avatar. He is the most merciful and he simply asks everyone to chant the holy name, to take part in the Sankirtan party. So in, when we do this chanting of the holy names, we can experience the awakening of the spiritual energy. We can see how the whole atmosphere becomes transformed with the chanting of the holy name. It's so important for us. However, there is quality in the chanting. And just as we have rules, there are some rules which we have to follow in the chanting. Right? It is not a professional performance, but it is a devotional performance. Lord Krishna wants our devotion. That devotion is our simple desire to want to please Lord Krishna. And certainly Lord Krishna is pleased by the chanting of His holy name. Lord Krishna Himself said, Naham Tishtani Vaikunte Lord is saying, I am not in the hearts of the yogis meditating on me. And I am not in Vaikuntha, the spiritual world. But I am wherever my devotees like Narada are chanting my holy name. So the Lord is so much pleased when one will chant his holy name. We want to please Lord Krishna. We want to please Him, we should chant. And Mahaprabhu came to teach everyone to chant. He says in Shikshastikam, Kirtaniya Sadahari, always chant the holy name. We can chant anytime, any place. 
There are no rules for this chanting. It can be done any time, any place, in any condition, purified or unpurified. You may say, no, I'm not purified, I'm not qualified to chant the whole thing. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, no, no, everyone can chant the holy name. You don't have to be purified. You may be, you may say, no, I'm a meat eater, I'm a sinful person, I do so many bad, it doesn't matter. We encourage you, come and chant and you will be purified. Of course, if someone said, I don't want to be purified, that worked to me. Right? You get people like that. They're so stubborn sometimes, they say, I don't want to be purified. Then we cannot help you. You don't want to be purified. <laughs> we may try, we may say, anyway, eat some prasadam, take some prasadam, find something you like. Even if you don't, if you don't chant yourself, if you simply hear the kirtan, you will be benefited. Just simply by being present in a room, where others are chanting, you will be hearing and you will be also benefited. You will also get purification without even knowing about it. That is the power of the holy name. Lord Krishna is so kind to people that he gives himself, he comes in this form as his holy name to allow all of us an opportunity to come out of our dark condition in materialistic life. So we want to try to take advantage of Lord Krishna's kindness. We want to chant the holy name. It's certainly not very difficult. It's a very simple mantra. And Lord Krishna is not even so much worried that your pronunciation may not be very good. But he wants your devotion. He wants your love. We have to chant from the heart. Right? Remember, it's not just a tongue exercise. It's not just the ear exercise. But we want to chant from the heart. We want to chant with feeling. Just like the child. When the, ch when the ch children cry, they want their mother. So Srila Prabhupada explains our chanting should be done in a similar manner. We should call for the Lord just like a child is calling for its parent. So we should think of Lord Krishna in that way. And we should chant with that feeling, that intense feeling. We want to develop that desire to come to Krishna, to be with Lord Krishna. It is said, you want to become Krishna conscious, you have to pay the price. Now, often when we go shopping, we will say, oh, give me discount. You know, we come sakam kitna rupiah jai. You know, we want to give me a discount. You know, what's the least price? Huh? Uh, well, every country you have that kind of statement, you know. Uh, so we want to get the lowest price. But Lord Krishna, the Shastras tell us there's no bargaining when it comes to going back to Godhead. When it comes to getting love of Krishna, there's no bargaining. There's no other price. You have to pay the price. And the price is that loyum, that intense greed to achieve it. And based on that verse, Srila Prabhupada coined this term Krishna consciousness. We have to have that eagerness to get it, to get something. Just like, you know, do, do you ever have things you want really badly? You want so badly, you know? Sometimes, you know, maybe you're, you're trying to get a job, you really want that job. And sometimes, you, you know, you, you want to get a scholarship, you really want that scholarship, you study very hard, try to get the scholarship. You really want something badly. 
And so we, we should think, I really want to develop love for Krishna. We, want, we should want it intensely. And we should have that intense greediness to achieve it. And our desire should be so strong that we would cry to get it. We would shed tears to get that love of Krishna. When we, when we can cry for Krishna, that is our success. I remember when I was staying in Calcutta many years ago in the temple in Calcutta, and one of our life members used to come to the temple there, and he used to talk to me. He used to say, he said, you know, I can cry for my business. You know, I had a business, you know, he was doing some business in Okay. He said, I can cry when my business doesn't go well. He said, I can cry when I quarrel with my wife. We don't get along sometimes, you know. I can cry for my children. Maybe something happens. We have a problem at home or something. I can cry for them. I can cry for all these different things. But I'm not able to cry for Krishna. He would lament. He said, I can cry for all these other people. Why can't I cry for Krishna? He said, that's what I really should be doing. I should be crying for Krishna. So we should also think like that. Gorgovinda Maharaj, when he was on the planet, he was saying he wanted to create a school for crying. To train everyone to cry for Krishna. So, of course, it's, it's a very exalted thing, it's a very high thing to be able to cry for Krishna. But we should, we should think like, think big, right? We want to get the, the highest thing, and the highest thing. Mahaprabhu has taught us the highest. Prem punarto mahan. The goal of life is to develop prem, Krishna prem, love of God. And, and to get that love of God, we have to have that greed, that loya. And when we have that greed, we will think about it constantly, and we will even cry to get it. So, this is my message to all of you this evening. Now is Chattur Mashiach, we're coming up to Balaram Purnima, and then Janmashtami, Radhastami. We should all want to engage more fully in the service of the Lord. Try to dedicate ourselves more in Krishna's service, to do more chanting and hearing, and take advantage of all the auspicious days. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Any questions, anyone? Maras, first of all, thank you very much for your divine association and as you rightly said your message to us indeed i i'm telling you from my heart that i felt that the whole philosophy of krishna consciousness is presented in this 45 minute talk Mara, which you spoke starting from uh, the importance of festival from balramji and you know coming up to the you know covering all the points and actually concluding on how we should chant and take shelter of the lord and cry for krishna and also spoke about uh, performing austerities, rules and regulations. So Maharaj, as a, as a practicing devotee, sometimes, you know, like, <laughs> there are certain times, uh, you know, where you need to follow some rules, sometimes you are not able to follow. So as you also rightly said, that one should approach the spiritual master or for us, a mentor or a counselor who can actually guide you how to properly, you know, to what extent we should go. Because some devotees focus too much on rules, some don't, but actually as an individual, where should we guess ourselves and how I am actually practicing Krishna Consciousness and how I am progressing in Krishna Consciousness sometimes, uh, you know, what rules or what austerities needs to be performed, somewhere it may not be possible and then how we actually, uh, like, you know, retrospect or introspect ourselves and progress in, in devotional service, so how we should be checking our own self that we are making progress and we are pleasing Krishna and Guru. Yes. Uh, 
Well, you said some of the rules and regulations may not be possible, but Srila Prabhupada has given us the basic rules and regulations. And if we have accepted the initiation into Krishna consciousness, then we are expected to follow four principles and 16 rounds, right? That's very important. <coughs> we cannot compromise on, on that. Four principles have to be followed, 16 rounds have to be maintained. This is the standard for Krishna consciousness. Uh, you, maybe Chaturmashya, it, it's not a very big thing which is being asked of us. Chaturmashya, you know, just to avoid uh, sak for one month and to avoid yogurt for one month, to avoid milk for one month. It's not such a big, difficult thing. But if one is serious in wanting to please the spiritual master, we should follow these things, make arrangements to follow them. How do we know if we're making advancement? Well, the example is given just like when you eat food, you know yourself if your hunger is satisfied, right? As we're eating in the beginning, we feel relief from hunger and you go on eating, you feel nourishment and satisfaction. And you know, you can't go on eating ever and forever and ever at a certain point and think, oh, enough, you know, I've had enough, I'm full now. So you come to that point, you, you reach, know ourself, we're satisfied. So similarly in our practice of devotional service, we will develop detachment from those things which are not in relation to Krishna consciousness. We just lose interest in these kind of things, you know, the football match or the Bollywood movie, the stock market, these different things which sometimes were so interesting to us. At a certain point, as we become more Krishna conscious, they have less and less meaning for us. And we're simply more concerned with our devotional service. We're more concerned to see the deities and to read Srimad Bhagavatam and to associate with the devotees and have kirtan. The more we become attached to these things, then that's a sign we're progressing in Krishna consciousness. How much have we got a taste for the mundane things? That is a sign how much we're still contaminated, how much we're still under the material energy. So we have to constantly check ourselves in these different things. Uh, the, in Srimad Bhagavatam it says, detachment from matter and then direct perception of the Lord and engagement in His service. It all comes about just like eating, relief from hunger, nourishment, strength and satisfaction. So by devotional service, simply by chanting, regularly chanting and hearing regularly, we develop att attraction for Krishna and we lose the interest in the material world. It's, we're not so much worried anymore. We're not neglectful, doesn't mean to be neglectful, doesn't mean to be careless, but we're not overly absorbed in the material energy. That's important. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, thank you so much for your transcendental presence and the wonderful class. Maharaj, you talked about retirement for householders. Uh, so, uh, just to clarify Maharaj, uh, retirement you said is, you know, reducing the activities that goes towards material, uh, stuff for economics and increasing the spiritual activities, the direct for 
and within this there can be you know my duty as a father uh, and my household duties they still remain right now and i can i can continue to be a father i can continue to be a husband son and so on and increase my spiritual activities is that is that uh, uh, one doesn't give up that for retirement Correct. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Well, with the with the vana prastha, it means retired life. I mean, usually you give up the job, retire from the work, material work. We're not. Uh, we want. We don't want to keep working until we drop, until the end of life. You know, at some point, we do want to stop working. And usually most countries in the world, they have some kind of retirement policy. So we give up material work, but we continue with our spiritual work. And of course, duties like being a husband, just like in Vanaprastha life, you can keep your wife with you. The wife stays with the husband. And the wife will continue to serve her husband and be with the husband. Often they'll go to the Holy Dham. And I said, many devotees have already gone from here. They've gone to the Holy Dham with their families. And their families are living there. Their wives are with them. And the children have also, had also gone there. And often the children are married and there. And they're, you know, taking up some duties. You know, they're, on, they're older, they're grown up. So they have their own, they take care of themselves. You know, children don't always need the father the whole life. The children grow up. Once the child is already 16, he's not a child anymore. You know, you're not, he's, he's, he doesn't need your care. They can stand on their own feet and take care of themselves. And so we have to understand that principle. You have to consider, we have to consider our own duty to our own self that we cannot spend our whole life just taking care of our children and taking care of, our, you know, of everybody in the family. You, you, you have to think about your own self also. And, that, and if they are an obstacle to your spiritual progress, then sometimes you may have to distance yourself from them. Just like Srila Prabhupada, you know, Srila Prabhupada himself did not want to take sannyas. He didn't want to renounce. He was a married man. He had five children. And, you know, he wanted to, and he was doing some business. And he, he was, initially he was thinking, I will make money and I will give money to my spiritual teacher. And my spiritual teacher can use the money for preaching. But then his spiritual teacher left the world. His spiritual teacher passed away. Prabhupada was initiated in 1933. I think it was 1936. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati left the world. And so Srila Prabhupada did not get a lot of association with his guru. But he always remembered the instructions. And he was hoping you know, that he could do business and make money, but the business failed. And he was trying to preach. He was having programs in his home, but things were not going well. The family were not cooperating. And at one point, even his scriptures disappeared. And Srila Prabhupada suspected that they had been sold <laughs> to get some money. <laughs> so Srila Prabhupada considered that it's so much trouble for me to be at home that he decided that he would leave the home and he went to live in Vrindavan. Not as a sannyasi, but as a Vanaprastha. His wife was not eager to go with him. She stayed with the, with the children, the sons. There were sons there, so she was staying with the son. And so Prabhupada went on his own and eventually he took sannyas. So he didn't go home again after that. 
But as a Vanaprastha, you can be at home, you can be with the family, you can be... Con but you don't want to always be concerned with the financial commitments of the family. You cannot always be responsible for all of these things. And you have to let the, the, you know, the children stand on their own feet. And ideally, the son should take care of the father and mother. Not that the son is being taken care of by the father, but the son takes care of the father and mother. Uh, Maharaj, I, I got, uh, thank you Maharaj for a wonderful lecture. Um, you brought up a nice point uh, during the lecture, uh, cost of living, uh, you know, to live in this material world. Um, so we all know that it's, you know, to live in this material world, it's all about transaction. What I mean transaction, you give something, you get something, irrespective of what kind of relation that you are, you know. It's all about transactions in this world. You pay something, you know, you get, uh, you know, something in return. So it's all about transaction. Even to the extent, you know, within family, you know, you give something, you get back something. You know, to, you take care of family, they give love, they give support, you know, they, they give food. So it's about transaction, everything. Uh, so that is a cost of living that I will pay to be able to live in this material world. So just to put in the same analogy, uh, if I have to, uh, you know, um, live and grow spiritually, what is the transaction that I should be making? What transaction required, you know, for me to you know, grow spiritually? Or in, uh, put it simply, uh, what is the cost of uh, living that I must pay so that I, I'll be able to grow spiritually? If you can give me some more... Uh, Lord Krishna said, you have to surrender to him. Surrender <laughs> means to accept everything favorable for devotional service and to give up everything which is not favorable for devotional service. That is the transaction. To give up all the nonsense, right? The things which have no connection to Krishna. And the, 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 the service is to engage in activities of devotion. Hearing and chanting, remembering, worshiping the deity, that is your duty. That is the transaction. Krishna wants our loving service. He doesn't want just simply your offerings, but he wants the loving service, the devotion. The devotional mood should be there. That mood to want to give to Krishna. But actually, we we have not. What do we have to give to Krishna? We have, we have nothing. We have nothing of our own. We want to give our own self to Krishna, that I am your servant. Please engage me in your service. The chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra is a prayer. O Supreme Lord Krishna, please engage me in your service. So that is our desire. We simply want to give service to Krishna without any expectation of anything in return, right? Devotional service should be ahaitaki, apratiya, should be unmotivated, and it should be uninterrupted. It should be continuous. That is the transaction. We give ourselves to Krishna. We belong to Krishna. He's our father. We are his children. It is our duty to serve him. So, what can you say? What can you get? Your devotion, your bhakti, that is what he wants. So we have to give loving service. Not just simply mechanical lip service. When we chant, we have to chant from the heart. Okay? Yes, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj, uh, thank you for a wonderful class and uh, full of instructions for all of us. Uh, Maharaj, you said that we have nothing to be proud of, but still we had developed that pride. So, how to always have that humble attitude? How to develop that humble attitude, uh, Maharaj? Well, I suggest you surrender to a spiritual master who will take away your pride. 
right? Maybe you get a heavy spiritual master who think you are a fool, you know nothing. <laughs> Sometimes Srila Prabhupada would say these things that the people around him, even to people like Tamal Krishna Goswami, he would say to him, there is nothing in your brain, you're fool, you're stupid. <laughs> so Prabhupada could say this thing, then it's very humbling. It's one way to get rid of pride. Surrender to the to the Nishinga Guru. <laughs> Someone who will tear you tear your ego apart. Yes? Maharaj, you were making this point of lolyam as the price that we need to pay. So many times in our practical experiences in life, we see that we start off with a very high goal. And maybe many uh, matters like maybe monetary goals or studies related goal or whatever. And then eventually we realize that no, maybe it's a very far-fetched goal and we settled on for a much lesser thing. Same way like many times in Krishna consciousness, we start with the highest goal which Mahaprabhu has given us frame to Martha Mahan. But eventually when we start realizing it is really something very, very far off. So that uh, lolyam sort of sometimes fades down that and we sometimes settle down that, okay, maybe let's settle down for Vaikuntha platform or even just for that matter, liberation from this material world. So how to keep up that lolyam of Krishna Prem, which is so far fetched goal and which, see, which seems in one sense impossible for us to attain, though Mahaprabhu has given us this process. Yes. Well, we we should know about these things. We have we have to know about these things. We have to know about these things. So it's good for us to hear. You know, even though we may be far away from these things, but it's good for us to understand that this is the really what we want, and to some degree. We have some kind of attachment, some kind of desire to achieve that. We may not have the, the full love, the full loyam which is really required to go back to the Goloka, but we have some degree of, you know, let me get out of this material entanglement and let me fix myself in some kind of service to Krishna. Whatever Lord Krishna considers suitable for me. Just let me have that opportunity to do something, to be somehow engaged in the Lord's service. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Das, Das, Das Anu Das, right? So it's not like we're going to serve Krishna directly, but we're a servant many, many times removed in the service of the Supreme Lord. We're insignificant servants, but that's okay. We're there, we're with Krishna, with the devotees, we're connecting, and that is, that is success. We, we, we just simply take shelter of Lord Krishna, and if Krishna wants, He will engage us, He will, he will bring us. We, sometimes we see that picture, uh, the coward boy is coming into Goloka, and Krishna is embracing him. It's saying, where have you been? I haven't seen you for so long time. So Krishna's waiting for us all to go back to him. You know, we should be thinking, maybe one time, maybe one day, after many, many crores of births, maybe some point in the future, we may also get that opportunity to go back to be with Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. His Holiness Bhakti Vidyana Vinashana Narsingha Bhagavan Maharaj Ki Jai!